Good evening. If you have a Bible or an app or something that you can read, or at least pretend to read scripture, um, we're looking at Matthew 5. So if you could open up to that. If you've got a blue Bible, it's page 969. Otherwise, um, just open up your app. And we're going from verse 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fall will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. We're at this point in Matthew's Gospel where Jesus has up until this point began to gather a group of ragamuffins and unexpected people who he calls his disciples to follow him around as he's performing miracles, starting to heal people. And this is the first part in Matthew's Gospel where we have a prolonged um, amount of Jesus' teaching because people are starting to ask the question, who are you, what do you stand for, and what do you plan to bring about? And the thing is, is that the Bible has this tradition Throughout, um, throughout the entire of the Bible where people have these mountaintop experiences. They go up mountains to meet with God, to, to be in God's glory, and God often in those moments gives them some commandments, gives them some edicts, gives them some rules to live by that change the direction of the way they live. And so Jesus, like that tradition, brings people up a mountain, but there's something slightly different about Jesus. He doesn't simply say, I think God is telling me this, Or he doesn't say something like, I am God's mouthpiece. He says some stuff as if he himself may be God. Which gave the the, the listeners of the day an option. Either he's mad and we should all go home, or he might be God and that changes everything. And it gives us today the same option. Either he's mad and we can go home and watch the Strictly Final or whatever it is we want to go home and do. Or he is God, and so we have to sit up and pay attention. And now it's lucky that I'm preaching today because I never get angry, ever. I never get angry, especially when people on the crowded tube want to read a broadsheet newspaper. Never get angry. I never get angry when I'm sitting in a cafe and and looking over a book and someone next to me has forgotten that their mobile phone carries in it a powerful microphone, which means they don't have to shout anymore to be heard across their conversation. I never get angry. I never get angry when someone calls me from a, an unknown number to tell me that I'm, I've been in some kind of accident and I'm, I've got millions that's coming my way. I never get angry. But of course, we all get angry. We all get angry, and for some people, it's very justifiable. We're only human. We all have reasons to get angry, being cut up on the motorway, people playing their music too loud on headphones, poorly served meal at restaurants, the Jonas Brothers. I mean, we all get angry for very justifiable reasons. But today, we're going to look at what God thinks about anger and how we deal with anger. The thing is, anger is not wrong. In the Old Testament, God the Father gets angry. In the New Testament, God the Son, Jesus, gets angry, and that is good news. And it's good news because God gets angry at suffering. He hates oppression. He hates manipulation. He hates lying, stealing, cheating, exploitation, idolization, uh, racial inequality, social outcasting, financial inequality, murder, pain, hurt. He gets angry at that stuff, and that is good news. It's also good news that God the Son, Jesus, gets angry. He gets angry at people not having access to community. He can't stand religious piety. He hates racial, social, and spiritual inequality. Anger is not wrong. And anger is just an emotion that if used, if harnessed, if kept under check, can bring about change, can bring life. But if unchecked, if unleashed, it can bring devastation, pain, and suffering. Jesus starts this passage by talking about murder. Now, I'm hoping that no one in this room thinks that murder is a positive response to a trigger, hopefully. However, I know that I've killed some people off 
in my thought life. I've killed them off my Instagram feed. I've killed them off my Christmas party invite list. And most importantly, I've killed them off my prayer list. The main thing to remember is that throughout this teaching, Jesus is calling his disciples to a higher standard of living than those who don't currently follow Jesus. And most of us in this room, I hope, are avoiding the thou shalt not murder commandment, I hope. Are we good with that one? But how are we doing with Jesus' appendix to this commandment? Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, or thank the Lord. I don't think I've ever said Raka to my brother or sister. Have you? But if you knew that Raka means worthless, have you ever felt anyone was without worth? empty of reason or necessity. They're, they don't add value. They don't contribute to my idea of a good time or good existence. They impinge on my perfect life. They interrupt my comfortable existence. Racker. Worthless. And fool. I wasn't brought up in the Middle Ages, so I don't go around calling people fools. But you ever thought someone was so stupid that the things they say, the way they think is unnecessary, unhelpful, not worth your time or your space? If you've ever felt that people, who people are, or what they think, or the way they think, is without any worth, then you're killing them off. And yet the Bible says that when God created you and I, we were very good. That humans are fearfully and wonderfully made. That God loves the world, and we should love our neighbors, and even pray for our enemies. The problem is, is if we begin to devoid people of any worth, they begin to become objects in our mind. Objects that we can just move to one side and carry on with our life. And the thing is about objects is objects do not need love. Objects do not need care. Objects do not need community. Objects do not need life. And so we kill them off. How we think about people matters. The way we view other people matters because it reflects how we feel about ourselves. Psychologists talk about a theory called projection theory, which is basically if you see something in other people that you actually struggle about yourself. So you might see in other people the way they're so rude to one another, because actually you also struggle with rudeness yourself. Well, I became a Christian when I was 16 and, and became part of a youth group. And I remember getting really angry with the cool kids who are allowed to lead worship or preach or do anything holding a microphone. And what would happen is I'd come in and, and I'd see who's holding the microphone, see it's one of the cool kids, and then I'd immediately disengage. I'd sit on the edges, I'd kind of th be thinking all the way they're doing everything wrong, and I'd just cut them off. However, it's because I was infinitely jealous. I'd never been in a place socially of influence like that, and so I envied their position. But yet, as I got to know them, I realized it was because they weren't seeking the limelight that God was giving them those opportunities but I completely disqualified them because of my own baggage. So how we treat each other really matters. And how we treat the creation, one another, matters because also it tells us and it tells God a little bit about how we view the creator. I've got a five-year-old Jemima and Jemima loves Lego. And we could spend hours making castles and houses and space rockets and ninja dojos. But if after a couple of hours of building one of these creations, I decided to rip it apart, throw it back in the box, dismantle it. She would think that her daddy doesn't care about the effort, the time, the imagination, the resources put into that. The way we treat God's creation tells God about how we view him. How we treat one another, the people that he says are fearfully and wonderfully made, tells him how we feel about him. God loves us all, intrinsically. And none of our disqualification will ever impinge on that. The mystery of the gospel is this, that God sent his son to take on the anger of the world for you and I and also the people we struggle with most. That God did that for them too. That they aren't too far from God's saving grace. Another thing we can learn from this passage is the answer is that anger leads to a descending spiral. Notice how Jesus says there are three types of response to releasing this kind of anger at someone. The first, he says, is judgment. And we see time and time again throughout the um, New Testament that um, we see this example of make sure that as you judge someone, you too aren't doing the same thing that you're judging them for. If you're finding that person hard at work because they always seem to assert themselves and, and become the center of attention, 
Make sure that you are being as encouraging and collaborative as you, as you possibly could be. The second response that Jesus talks about is the core, or the Greek word is the Sanhedrin, which is the religious core. And I think what Jesus is saying here is that be careful because the way you treat other people, the way you think about other people is an intrinsically spiritual thing. There's no difference between how you talk about people outside the four walls of the church and within the four, the four walls of the church. And then thirdly, the fires of hell. If you're new to church today and you're thinking, if I hear that word, I'm out, please hold on, it's good news. The fires of hell in its original Greek translates to the fires of Gehenna. And Gehenna was a physical, real place. It was outside the city walls. It was the city dump where all the waste was taken to and set alight. And it's where cultic sacrifices, human child sacrifices happened. It was a place of devastation where nothing good grew there. And what Jesus is saying is if you're treating people and you're disregarding them, you're thinking they're void of any worth, then in an ideal community, the only place for you may be outside the city walls. There's a descending spiral to this kind of anger. And so, what do we do with anger that we may, we may be experiencing or we may be on the receiving end of? Well, I'd like us to look for a model of traffic lights. And the first one being the red light, stop. When we stop, we gain perspective. So many of the things that anger us is because our own pride is hurt. Our ego is bruised, our ambitions are quashed, and it's too easy in those moments to lash out, to kick out, get the moral high ground, or assert ourselves aggressively for a quick fix of adrenaline. Stop. The book of Proverbs says a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Stopping when you're feeling that anger rise allows you to get the perspective of heaven. What are the larger things at play? What's going on in, in the world? What's happening for that thing to present itself? But it also helps us get the perspective of the earth. What is the root of our anger? Is it coming from a Holy Spirit prompting or some unresolved brokenness in me? Maybe a person is acting like that because they've got something else going on in their life. My wife recently was trying to get a new mobile phone plan and she called a company that is, uh, that is prided for having great customer service. We'll call them GG for now. And, um, and as she was kind of trying to negotiate her plan, the person on the other end of the line was getting more and more aggressive, more and more angry at her. And my wife, she said, um, I thought that you were prided on your customer service. I don't quite like the tone that you're taking with me. To which the person immediately said, I'm so sorry. I'm having the worst day. And started to like open up on the other end of the phone. Um, and the thing is, is that we had some friends over for dinner and, and, they, and they work in a bit of customer service and do some of this training. And they, and they said that a lot of people on the other end of those lines, they're working crazy shit, 14 hours, whatever. They have to get up at 11 to completely change their life and their family. Imagine having kids and not being able to take them to school because you have to go to the customer call center, so you're paid a pittance, all this stuff. Suddenly, as we stop, we gain perspective. And so when I get that call from that unknown number, the perspective starts to open. Maybe I'll be a bit more gracious. But not only that, stopping allows us to remember the grace that we ourselves have been saved by. I became a Christian when I was 16, and I don't know about you, but when I became a Christian, my life wasn't perfect. I had some mess that I needed to be saved from. And it might be a surprise, but I'm still navigating my way through a lot of that mess. Each one of us, if we know Jesus to be our savior, knows that we have something to be saved from. And so as we stop, when we feel that anger rise, we realize we too are saved by grace. Not by because we've graduated into perfectionness, perfection. Not because we've graduated into some kind of ethereal sense of goodness. But we too are products of grace. Stopping allows potentials to become apparent and wisdom to flow. In the, in the Old Testament, Nehemiah is rebuilding a wall. And he, it says this in the book of Nehemiah. When I heard the outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you're charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them. If you feel the anger, stop. 
And like Nehemiah, ponder, and God will give you wisdom. The first one, red, stop. Second, amber, pray. When you give your time with Jesus, when you give your quiet space or the hidden time over to people who wind you up, over to the people that make you angry, your heart expands. It becomes larger. And I've heard it said loads in Christian circles, well, I get righteously angry. And I understand it. There are some things that people do that are so evil, so disastrous, so hurtful, that being angry seems to be the most logical and justifiable position. I get it, believe me. There's probably one person alive who I think it would be justifiable for me, personally, to be angry with. Don't get me wrong, but this, there's been times where this person has caused me utter rage, a rage that is sometimes crippling, disruptive, robbed me of sleep, made me exert aggression in unhealthy ways and filled my thought life at times. And that person is currently serving a prison sentence for the abuse I received while under his care as a child. I'll be totally justified by most humans to feel a kind of rage and anger. However, the problem is I became a Christian and the Bible is inconvenient. And Paul's letter to the Ephesians says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. And just a couple of verses later, Jesus says on his words on the mount, he says, pray for those who mistreat or harm you. Three times a year as a church, we gather together to um, do a 21-day prayer campaign called 1102, just before Alpha begins. And last year, I felt a prompting to spend 21 days praying for this person. Do I condone what he did? Definitely not. Is what he did okay? No. But am I letting him live rent-free in my head? Not at all. It took 17 years to get to a place where I could pray for him, but this is a journey, not just an overnight fix. But no longer am I hell-bent on revenge or comeuppance, but allowing space for people to find their identity in Christ, to find freedom and their acceptance in the people of God. C.S. Lewis said, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Ephesians 4.26 says, in your anger, do not sin. As we stop, we gain perspective. As we pray, our hearts realign for God's cosmic plan for the reconciliation of all things. Red, stop. Amber, pray. And green, go. Emotions like anger are like fast flowing rivers. When harnessed can be used for energy and provide life, but when left, they can corrode destroy and even kill anger can be a force for good as long as you don't let it drive the passage says first go and be reconciled then come and offer your gift do all you can to make your side of the bed clean do all you can to make your side of the garden tidy make sure your check is balanced the thing is sometimes full reconciliation is not possible Perhaps the person that angers you is a celebrity, a politician, someone you don't have personal access to. Maybe they're on the other side of the world. Maybe they've passed away. But forgiveness and reconciliation is not a human effort, but the Spirit's work. And some of the Psalms make for difficult reading because David is presenting his anger before God. But the reason we are able to read them is because David presented them as an act of worship to God. Make sure you don't bottle it, but give it to God. He was honest with his father, and that honesty allows us thousands of years later to present our all to the father. Perhaps for you, anger has become a default, a habit, or a pattern. And the wisdom for you, the green light, is go and seek help. If your anger is causing you or others pain, seek help. We pray as a community but also we can get professional help to be at a place where we can be honest. And I've gone through that. We just can't let anger become a quicksand that consumes us and our world. So as we stop, we gain perspective. As we pray, we gain God's wisdom and then we go. We go with the right intentions. When we often talk about anger in the church, people often say, well, Jesus got angry um, because of the cleansing of the temple, where he came in, found money lenders in the temple, and went out. But it's so telling, this verse, it says, you have turned my father's house 
into a den of robbers. For Jesus is about something bigger than his own, than just him. The thing is, is anger is helpful when the attention is diverted from people, but to systems, from personalities to structures. It's how abolitions happen, how bills of freedom get signed, how the poor, the dispersed, the underrepresented people in society find justice. St. Augustine has been ascribed by saying that hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger that things are the way they are and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. We've got to remember that ultimately God's anger is good news. It's the kind of anger that doesn't want his children to be hurt, harmed, go down wrong paths or live lives alone. All he wants is, our ch- is us, his children, to be brought back to him accept his rule and reign because it means flourishing of all creation, all peoples, and he wants it so bad that he sent his only son to absorb all of the earth's anger upon himself, dying on a cross, so that the anger you and I deserve for going our own way is washed away, and the path is made straight for us to commit ourselves back to God. So wherever you are today, whether you're bubbling with a seething rage, unvented anger, Maybe today you're a recipient of anger. Or maybe you are passionate about seeing those in the poorest of situations in the world finding their place in the kingdom of God. Remember that above all, God says, come back to me. All anger finds its proper place, its proper end at the cross of Christ. And it stands above creation, drawing all things to himself. The Bible paints a picture that one day there will be no more hurting, no mourning, no pain. Every tear will be wiped away and we will see Jesus face to face. So anger might, the subject might bring up all kinds of things. Perhaps here today you're carrying a relationship that you just haven't been able to forgive someone. Perhaps today you're, you, you've got this kind of energy that's unventable, this kind of seething range, rage that you're just longing to find out what the root is. But perhaps some of you, God is stirring in you a passion to bring about change on this earth where you have seen some darkness, you've seen something, you've got angry about it, but God is saying, I want to stoke that flame into a passion for change and reconciliation in some part of the world. So we're going to pray for those things. If you're willing, why don't you stand and we're going to pray.